eh, con quasi un quarto d'ora accadendo cominciamo, sono, siamo a 12 minuti. Eh, si sente? Sì, va bene. Ok. Eh, so, we are really happy to have Tim Ingold with us uh, this evening. And this is, it is an invitation that comes by a collaboration between the Dottorato in Storia, Antropologia e Religioni della Sapienza, Università di Roma, where uh, yesterday Ingold gave a lecture entitled uh, Of Work and Words, Draft as a Way of Death. <clears throat> and the master uh, studied in Ambiente del Territorio and the Environment of Humanities at the Universidad of Sardin di Roma 3, co-directed by Daniela Misrucci, uh, Dario Gentili, and myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so our master is a second level program and it is an interdisciplinary, or, or as we more like to say, undisciplined master. It belongs to two departments, uh, architecture and field cost philosophy, communication, and uh, spectacle, and it crosses different knowledges, territories, from philosophy to art, from political theory to sociology, from history and geography uh, to urban planning and architecture, from law to economics, from political ecology to communication. An approach to the territory that is not technocratic and extractive, uh, extractive as we say today, but rather uh, humanistic, capable of creating social dynamics, practices, knowledge, experience, and forms of life that are constantly generated even outside the project with a capital P which in English translates as design. Uh, it is certainly because of this undisciplined approach that we find ourselves in great agreement with him and his definition of anthropology. Anthropology, in my definition, it says, is philosophy with the people in. And I will be tempted to do a game to say that architecture could be at this point, anthropology with the space in, so also with people in. Uh, at this point, let me apply a brief biography of Ingo before giving him the floor. Tim Ingo uh, is an anthropologist, emeritus professor of social anthropology at the University of Aberdeen, fellow of British Academy and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, but he is, above all, a scholar who interviews diverse knowledge such as the 4A of anthropology, archaeology, art, architecture, with philosophy and environmental science to describe a world where the human is no longer at the center. In 1999, he established the number in the UK, UK uh, US Department of Anthropology, directing a university strategic research camp on the north. It carried out an um, uh, ethnographic field, field work among Sami and Finnish people in Lapland, writing on comparative questions of environment, technology, and social organization in circumpolar north, as well as the role of animals in human society, on issues on human ecology and on evolutionary theory in anthropology, biology, and history. Since uh, 2005, he's been activating the research exploration in the comparative anthropology of the line. And uh, since uh, 2015, he's been directing the research knowing from the inside, anthropology, art, architecture, and design. Uh, as of uh, 2018, he retired from the university to continue his studies as an independent scholar. Among his book, translated into Italian, we remember Ecologia della Cultura, nel temi, Making Antropologia, Archeologia, Arte e Architettura, Raffaello Portina, e Siamo Line, per un'ecologia delle relazioni sociali, per cani, e corrispondenza, sempre Raffaello Portina. Ok, I leave you the floor. Thank you for being with us.
thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you for having me. Uh, I feel a bit intimidated myself in these magnificent surroundings, uh, but I'll do my best. I'll, of course, be speaking in English. Uh, I'll try to be as clear as possible, but please, if anybody has a problem, uh, put your hand up or something, and I'll try and... Uh, well, well, I hope we can, we can, we can manage. The uh, inspiration for this talk comes from an exhibition by the work of an artist called David Lem at the Edinburgh Printmakers Gallery in the spring of 2015. Entitled Debris and Phenomena, Lem's work consisted of a number of pieces in which iconic marks were superimposed upon old nautical charts. What had intrigued Len was that these charts, which he had found by chance amidst piles of discarded papers, these charts had once been vital tools for navigators in shaping their perception of the maritime world. So how did they end up being thrown away? Does discarding the maps mean relinquishing a perception that we could not have had without them? Or can such perception really rest on such a fragile foundation that it could disappear with a few scraps of waste paper? Or if to the contrary, it does not depend on them, then why were, we, why were these maps so important? in the first place. So, intrigued by these questions, David Lem had saved the charts, which would otherwise have been thrown away, and they showed very little. Here and there were numbers recording depths with occasional contour lines, and on every sheet a graded semicircle indicating all the degree points of the compass. Now, on each sheet, Lem had overprinted a schematic map of a small neighbourhood of the city of Edinburgh in the faintest of colour, which did no more than separate the spaces of open ground from blocks of buildings. This then provided the almost blank surface upon which were stamped fragmentary icons in bold black ink. There were zigzags, hatched circles, crosses, a squiggle, an icon that looked a bit like a ladder, another that looks a bit like a satellite aerial dish, and yet another that resembled the outline of half a mushroom with dots. So there it is. You can just see maybe a slight pinkness. That's the open spaces. The white is buildings. And then on, and you can see on the right, the half uh, the, the compass rows with the directions, and then you can see all these icons, these curious marks that Len has, has printed on top. Well, on a very windy day in Edinburgh in March 2015, I attended a, an event entitled Landmarks, in which the artist challenged us, his audience, to recreate a version of one of these prints by walking a route in the neighbourhood. Each of us was provided with a sheet of paper mounted on a clipboard. The sheet was blank, apart from the shapes of the spaces in which we could wander, blocked out in faint pink against a white background. We were to proceed along a route marked out with a number of way stations where Lem had placed balloons and posted volunteers to guide us on. And at every station, he had also placed a rubber stamp and an ink pad. So each stamp was cut with a particular icon selected from the repertoire that Lem had used for his presentation. And the icon stood for a particular detail of the urban fabric visible from that point. Perhaps a, a flight of steps or some railings or the lintel of a door. Little details that could take some time to locate 
but which held your attention once you spotted them. And to discover them was at the same time to realize just how much passes us by unheeded and unremarked, how much we simply fail to notice, which is almost everything. But to certify that we had been there and seen the detail in question, we were to stamp our piece of paper at the appropriate place on the pink layout. So after wandering for an hour or so, we returned with our sheets stamped with some 10 different icons. So each of us had, in our own modest way, recreated one of Lem's pieces, except that ours were on plain paper rather than on nautical charts. Now for Lem, all of this was meant as a meditation on the fragmentary nature of experience and on the tension between the bird's eye view of urban space and the street level view of the built environment and its features. He also wanted us to reflect on the idiosyncratic construction of narrative meaning and on how this influences our perception of place. But for me, the exercise brought to mind another set of concerns, which were perhaps highlighted by the fact that it was such a windy day. As I walked the streets, I felt almost as though I could have been sailing. And having already viewed the exhibition and seen how Lem had reused the old nautical charts, I began to imagine that I, that I was myself at sea that my ample raincoat was a sail, and that the balloons that marked the way stations through which I had to pass were, were, were marine boys. Suddenly, the features that I was to seek out began to seem like bric-a-brac bric -brac afloat on the ocean waves. Holding my coat before the wind, was I sailing a flooded city? Now, in reality, of course, I was on dry land and the features were all firmly fixed in place. I was not sailing, but walking, and the pavement remained firm beneath my feet. But what if it were otherwise? What if the ground of the city were an ocean and its buildings ships? Well, oceans cover more than two thirds of the surface of our Earth. And beneath the planet's outer crust in the mantle, there may be enough water to fill all of its oceans combined twice or even three times over. Every time a volcano erupts, some of this water gushes out as steam. And when it cools and condenses, it rains down on the earth. Perhaps that's how oceans formed in the first place some four billion years ago. Be that as it may, it was in, in these waters that life first evolved, eventually finding its way onto land only once organisms had developed ways to hold on to the aqueous fluids that still formed the greater part of their bodily substance. In this sense, Human beings, who of course are among the most recent of species to have inhabited the earth, human beings are still creatures of the ocean, even though they undoubtedly evolved on land, probably far from any shore, with bodies adapted to conditions of life in relatively open terrestrial environments. Moreover, notwithstanding some rather fanciful theories that among other things, have attributed the orientation of masculine chest hair to the prowess of ancestral swimmers or the origins of language to the breath control required of them, humans have only a very limited capacity to endure beyond the reach of land. Even the most athletic of them can swim unaided over only a relatively short distance and hold their breath underwater for no more than a few minutes. To go further, or to spend a longer time at sea, our ancestors needed some kind of watercraft. 
Now, it's hard to know when they first took to the waves because things that float tend not to last and being necessarily fashioned from lightweight and perishable materials. Most likely, the first voyages were accidental when storm or tide took craft designed for inshore waters far out to sea. But the subsequent development of ocean-going vessels, along with the ways of life that have surrounded them, has been among the most remarkable chapters of human technical evolution. In many ways, and for several millennia, it turned the world inside out, as the great expanses of the sea offered the best opportunities for long-distance travel and trade. The land, by contrast, became a barrier with its fast-flowing rivers, treacherous marshes, marshes, deserts, and mountain ranges uh, offering... uh, ranges presenting formidable obstacles to movement. So islands, once remote and cut off, became centers of human commerce, while inland tracts, which were unreachable by water, became terra incognita, a situation that persisted until the transport revolutions of modern times brought road, rail, and latterly air travel to the fore, relegating many islands again to the periphery. As the geographer Kenneth Olwig remarks, history itself could be characterized in terms of such changes in the relative predominance of waterborne and landborne infrastructure. But there are signs that humanity's relation to the ocean is about to be redefined once again. And this time, much of the responsibility lies with human beings themselves, firstly in the development of an industrial economy, the exponential growth of which has been fueled by the combustion of fossil fuels, and secondly in their clearing of the land to make way for prodigious numbers of domestic animals that allow more and more of the Earth's ever-growing human population to enjoy a diet rich in meat. The consequence release into the atmosphere of massive quantities of carbon dioxide and methane gases is causing temperatures to rise around the globe at a rate not seen since the yet more rapid global warming that heralded the end of the last ice age some 12 millennia ago. The melting of the huge ice sheets of the Arctic and Antarctic regions expected over coming decades looks set to finish off what remains of the last glaciation. And not only will this raise sea levels to a point that will threaten many low-lying coastal conurbations around the world, it could also redirect the ocean currents that control much of the Earth's climate. As a result, global warming could actually push some regions accustomed to balmy temperatures into a much chillier regime, while yet leaving other regions overheated and desiccated. And with the encroachment of oceans upon the land, submerging once populous regions, fresh water will be the next scarce resource over which nations will compete or even go to war. Now, all this is well known. Indeed, some sort of collapse seems inevitable. Prognostications for the future vary from apocalyptic visions of species extinction to utopian fantasies of a once and for all geotechnical fix that will secure humanity's tenure of the planet for eternity. But just as the initial glacial melt that marked the onset of the Holocene epoch is popularly supposed to have set the stage for human history, so its final melt at the onset of what is billed as our new epoch, which scientists were quick to name the Anthropocene, is predicted to bring down the curtains. 
Whatever the merits of the designation, which are much debated, neither the apocalyptic nor the utopian version of Anthropocene destiny seems remotely plausible. More likely, chroniclers of a thousand years from now, if there are such, will look back on an event roughly spanning four centuries from 1700 to 2100, marked by a seemingly unstoppable surge, followed by an equally calamitous crash, after which it was back to business as usual for the human species, albeit in a world that could take millennia to recover from the event's impact. Come what may, the oceans will continue to eat away at terrestrial shores, presenting an unceasing existential danger for their inhabitants, to whose fate the oceans are utterly indifferent. But there's nothing new in the ocean's threats to overwhelm inhabited lands. They've done so often enough before, most notably at the end of the last glacial period. We are, after all, but the survivors of previous inundations, stranded on what can only be described from an oceanic perspective as the high ground of the continental crust its plateaus and mountain ranges still poking out above the waters. From Doggerland in the North Sea to much of the Recherche archipelago of Western Australia, many lands previously home to flourishing human communities now lie under sea, silent and mysterious. Occasionally, Tools and weapons, once used for life on land, turn up in the nets of fishing vessels. It was a massive landslide along the edge of Norway's continental shelf, dated to around 6200 BC, and the resulting tsunami, that is thought to have engulfed much of Doggerland, leaving only a few residual islands. In other cases, the immediate causes of flooding were seismic. The ancient city of Pavlopetri in the Peloponnese was submerged as a result of an earthquake some 3,000 years ago. In the year AD 365, another earthquake sank an island off the coast of Egypt that had formed part of the ancient port of Alexandria. And yet another violent quake, quake in 1692 left two-thirds of the city of Port Royal in Jamaica underwater. But it was the more gradual, if relentless, bombardment from the waves that, in 1929, caused the cliffside neighborhood of San Pedro in Los Angeles to slide gracefully but inexorably into the Pacific as the clay foundations on which its desirable homes were built eventually crumbled. So what these and many other comparable events show is that the sea has not risen imperceptibly, creeping over the land so gradually that no one in their lifetimes would have noticed. Rather, rising seas were witnessed then, as they are now, in the more frequent incidents of catastrophic events. In living memory, Tidal floods, storm surges and typhoons, along with earthquake-induced tsunamis, have torn at coastlines and brought massive destruction and loss of life to people in many parts of the world. And each time catastrophe strikes, it reminds us of the fact that the surface of the sea is not level. It rather sloshes about, one huge, continuous mass that is stretched, crumpled and swirled by the forces of earthly and lunar gravity, by the rotation of the planet, by the differential heating of the sun, by the friction of the irregular seabed below and the convulsions of the atmosphere above. And along the coasts, 
This sloshing is visible in the cycle of the tides and in the formation of sand or single beaches alternately exposed and submerged as the tides go in and out. But for mariners at sea, it is experienced as currents and gradients. So if you are operating a fishing boat from the shore, you can save fuel by leaving at high tide freewheeling down the slope of the sea and then returning once the gradient is reversed. Sea level, in short, is a cartographic abstraction and a pretty strange one at that. Look at a map of the world and it is as if the sea itself had solidified into a single isotropic and featureless plane. It has no waves, no currents, nothing lies above, nor is there anything underneath. You cannot sink into it, let alone drown in it, though you could lose your bearings. Indeed, in the eyes of cartographers and the landlubber authorities they serve, sailing is fundamentally a problem of navigation, not of handling ships at sea. And perhaps it was the peculiarity of this navigational perspective that Lewis Carroll aimed to satirize when, in his nonsense poem, The Hunting of the Snark, he had the ship's bellman bring on board, I quote, a large map representing the sea <coughs> without the least vestige of land. It was a map, cried the crew, they could all understand a perfect and absolute blank. There was nothing on it. Upon this blank surface are then mounted irregular shapes, both great and small, of curious and convoluted outline. These represent land masses, which may be further built up upon the maritime base level, contour by contour, by adding further layers of progressively diminishing extent. So lands of all shapes and sizes appear con contained within their outlines. That's why we call the most extensive of them continents. The ocean, on the contrary, is perceived to be incontinent. It has no boundaries, no outlines of its own. We often speak of crossing the ocean to get from one land to another, but rarely do we speak of crossing the land to get from one ocean to another. On our maps, straits are commonplace, but the isthmus is an anomaly. But what appears on the map as an outline is, in the world it represents, but a shifting and indistinct line of transition, indicated on rocky shores by differential staining or in the distribution of barnacles, or on flats by saltwater vegetation, and on sands by the wash of the tide. Beyond it, the land carries on, under sea as its elevation falls, over sea as it rises. So in truth, the land is no more contained or enclosed within its shores, then is the sea kept out by them. Fishermen know their offshore grounds as intimately as farmers know their soils. They can be worked, dredged, even cultivated, just as surely as farmers work the land on shore. But if the land extends into the ocean, so also the ocean extends into the land. In the precipitation born of evaporation from ocean surfaces that feeds the land's freshwater basins and subterranean aquifers. The geographers Kimberly Peters and Philip Steinberg go so far as to suggest that the ocean should be understood better as extension than as entity, as a material excess that all, always overflows whatever barriers we might put up against it. And as such, they say, 
The ocean exists far inshore, above ground, underground, in our senses, and as part of fantasy. So the relation of land to sea is one of over and under, not of side to side, requiring us to think in terms of the relativities of shallowness and depth, rather than the absolute bilateral switch of onshore and off. So like the land, the ocean is everywhere, in us and around us, and we don't have to visit the coast or go to sea to meet it. And yet, the division between land and ocean, however indistinct it may be in real life, has long been foundational to the very idea of the polity, at least as this has come down to us in the canons of Western thought. The many city-states of ancient Greece, dotted around the islands and peninsulas of the Aegean archipelago, while dependent on the sea for travel and trade, took pains to protect their political order from the sea's transgressive influence. The polis had continually to defend itself against attack from the sea and its waterborne forces, never the other way around. In book four of his dialogue, Laws, Plato had the Athenian, a stranger to the island of Crete, declare that the sea, while pleasant enough as a daily companion, can be a right grimy and bitter neighbour, which brings to its shores all manner of raiders, rogues and tricksters. For safety and security, Plato insisted, the city should be located well inland. And even Aristotle, while stressing the importance of access to the sea for commerce, acknowledged in Book 7 of his politics that the influx of strangers caused by the sea's proximity can corrode good government. Every polis then figures as an island of order anchored in the ocean of disorder that threatens ever to unravel it. And this is an idea that continues to resonate today in the trope of the urban archipelago, consisting of islands of formal architectural regularity set amidst a sprawling ocean of deregulation and decay. Now the con containment of the polity as a node in a network of trading relations has its counterpart in the containment of the ship, the ship conceived as a vessel which should ideally keep its cargo intact as it plies from port to port across the incontinent expanse of the ocean. In this sense, the ship is an example of what the philosopher Bruno Latour would call an immutable mobile, that is, an object that can undergo displacement through otherwise empty space while maintaining its properties as it goes. The object, in Latour's terms, is Galilean, the space Euclidean. And depending on the nature and packaging of its cargo, the ocean-going vessel of today is envisaged as a colossal container, or a container for containers, designed to span the distance between continents without discharging any of its content to the sea. So just as the continent is supposed to contain its immovable territory within its shores, so the ship should contain its movable cargo within its hold. Each implies the other. But real lands are not like that, and nor are real ships. Neither do they contain, nor are they contained. And it's by considering how real lands and real ships differ from the ideal 
that we can begin to see how the classical opposition between the city and the ocean might be dissolved. Because the real ship is a rusting hulk that as it goes pumps quantities of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere even as it leaks fuel into the sea along with the effluent of life lived on board and the inevitable spillages of cargo that occur in rough weather. According to one estimate, some 1,500 containers are lost at sea every year, or the equivalent of roughly four per day. So the ship is not so much a vessel as a floating center of concentration and discharge sunk within a turbulent but semi-supporting medium. Real lands, too, are not sealed within their borders, but carry on a perpetual dialogue with the sea. In the hydrological cycle, in the harvesting of maritime, maritime and undersea resources by terrestrial populations, and in the atmospheric effects of industrial emissions as they are absorbed by ocean currents. Indeed, the lands discharge no less than ships into the sea, which is gradually filling up with such quantities of waste as to form floating islands, which may eventually become home to terrestrial life forms, possibly including humans. Already, landfill is being used for reclamation projects to create airport runways, marinas and resorts in shallow waters. And finally, the real ocean, intrinsically incontinent, is not merely an empty space to be traversed, but a dynamic element which requires of the mariner detailed knowledge and constant attention if he is to handle his ship without mishap. In short, the ship, the ship, the continent and the ocean all challenge the logic of container and content, with its neat apportionments of the materials of life to the categorical compartments of law and politics. Well, during the war years of the early 1940s, Carl Schmitt, political theorist, jurist and prominent Nazi, was at work on a book subsequently published under the title The Nomos of the Earth. And in it, he made much of the division between land and sea. Only on land, Schmidt insisted, can the earthling, man, make his mark. He can make no mark in the sea, for, wrote Schmidt, on the waves there is nothing but waves. Now, the surfer, of course, might retort indignantly that on land, where Schmidt's man would fight his wars, there is nothing but trenches. In the trench, the body sticks and its senses clog, but the surfer in the wave is hyper alert, his entire existence borne along on this one overwhelming but self-annihilating movement, where the trench is a place of death, to ride the breaking waves is to feel truly alive. But if the surfer lies at one extreme in his relation to the waves, at the other extreme lie the passengers on board a cruise liner, provided with everything they could desire for a life of luxury in what is in effect a giant floating hotel, they might witness the sea as a blue expanse and enjoy the uninterrupted skies. But the last thing of which they would have any direct experience would be the waves. To all intents and purposes, the ocean looks to them entirely flat, save only for the curvature of the earth that causes distant ships to appear to drop below the horizon rather than to contract into a vanishing point. In short, 
If the surfer on his board cannot see the ocean for the waves, then the passenger on board the cruise liner cannot see the waves for the ocean. One lives for the moment inside a breaking event, the other anchors for an eventless eternity. Perhaps, as the historian Barry Hickman argues, it is all a question of perspective. Depending on the scale of observation, whether close up or on high, we witness, says Hickman, either the local chaos of crashing waves or the great curve of the earth. So it seems we're faced with a choice between one and the other. The more our attention is captured by the waves, the less we see of the ocean, the more our vision pans out over the ocean, the less we see of the waves. The ocean in this scenario has no waves. Flat and monotonous, it's like the Bellman's map, a perfect and absolute blank. Conversely, as locally situated events, waves have no ocean. Indeed, they could just as well be made by a machine. And so, while the passengers in the cruise liner glide serenely over the vacant surface of the ocean, the surfer occupies a wave bubble that will burst on the instant it breaks upon the shore. So here, both the surfboard and the liner afford means not to inhabit a world, but to escape from it, whether through instant gratification for the surfer or timeless reverie for the passenger on the cruise ship. Indeed, for the real world to intrude from either end would spell disaster. Passengers on board the cruise liner, like their ill-fated predecessors on the Titanic, only experience the waves as the ship goes down, and surfers experience the ocean only when the wave becomes a tsunami and engulfs them all. We discover in these catastrophes that the waves and the ocean can only really be held apart by artifice, by feats of engineering on an ever greater scale, involving bigger and bigger ships on the one hand, and ever more impressive marine defences on the other, and we find that all such events, all such attempts, are bound ultimately to fail. But the mariners of old would never have imagined the ocean as a blank sheet, nor could they separate the ocean from its waves. They rather found themselves in the midst of an elementary struggle between waters below and airs above, caught in the wind-driven crumple and churn of the roiling brine. Here, out at sea, waves don't break, but alternately swell and subside in an unceasing movement of formation and dissolution. So that's what the ocean is for the mariner, not so much a body of water, as the condition of a world in flux. And waves, in the mariner's experience, are the ocean's way of making its presence felt, above all, in the pitch, yaw and roll of his vessel. And moreover, the mariner's ship, as we've already seen, is not a Galilean object in a Euclidean sea, nor does it bore through ocean waters indifferent to their flux and variation. And if this is true, even of the massive ships and liners of today, how much more so it would have been in the days of sail. The ship of those times was a place of gathering, of gathering of wind into sails, of currents into timbers, and above all, of crew into a community wherein life depends on the, where life, where life depends on the seaworthiness of the craft. Because it's here, perhaps, that we find the most fundamental difference between life at sea and life on land. People on land depend on others for many things, but one thing they can normally be sure of 
is that the ground will support them, even without others to hold them up. Social life on land rests on this confidence that whatever else may be at stake, the ground lies firm underfoot. But at sea, there can be no such confidence. What lies beneath is not a cushion of support, but an abyss. And people must hold on to one another and maintain their craft if they are not to sink. Not for nothing does the word shit, used alternately as noun and suffix, connote both the vessel and, as in fellowship, for example, a community of sorts. And yet in this sense, the ship, as much as its converse, that is terra firma, is as much a state of mind as a physical condition. Because there are times, even on land, when we lose confidence in the ground's support and fall back on others for assistance. At such times, as we say, we are all at sea. And in just such a moment of uncertainty, I wake from my dreams of oceans and ships, and still swaying as my sense, in my senses, as sailors do on first setting foot on dry land after months at sea, I find myself back on the windy streets of Edinburgh. I am surrounded by buildings laid out on a grid. Do these buildings, I wonder, rest upon the ground like solid blocks on an underlying platform of support? Or do they float like ships in the ocean? Now, of course, the conventional discourse of infrastructure and superstructure inclines us to the first view. But as I sail the windy streets, holding in my mind David Lem's nautical charts, I wonder whether it might be otherwise. What if we were to think of the buildings, not as raised upon rigid foundations, but as suspended in a world of flux, with the swirl of the winds above and the churn of the earth below, and the ground between as the more or less turbulent medium of their altercation. For my dream of the sea had caused me to doubt what once I had taken for granted, namely that the ground is originally there as a foundation for everything else that might occupy my attention. Now, to be sure, the paved street seems solid enough, but its surface was not given from the outset. It had, at some time in the past, to be engineered. First, the soft air earth would have been drained, resting islands of solidity from the originally waterlogged substrate, while confining the liquid residue to run along pipes and conduits or between embankments. And this created the urban equivalent of an archipelago. Then the earth, now dried and hardened, would have been surfaced by coating with a rigid layer of water-resistant material such as concrete or asphalt. Only by these means is the ground fashioned as an infrastructure upon which the superstructure of the city can be erected. And yet, even the most heavily engineered of grounds cannot withstand the elemental forces of sky and earth that erode it from above and subvert it from below. Eventually, it cracks and crumbles, exposing the soils beneath to light moisture and currents of the air. And with that, it bursts into life, overwhelming human attempts. To cover it up. So even as I walk the Edinburgh streets, I have to watch my step for tree roots that have lifted paving stones, for weeds that have grown through cracks, and for water-filled potholes in the tarmac. So the hard surface, it turns out, is but the thinnest of crusts, beneath which the earth, slowly but surely, continues its heave 
and swell. So what then becomes of buildings? The architect might like to think that the ground is no part of the building as such, but merely a placeholder, a reference surface, a, a plot for it to stand on, or a purely horizontal platform for his constructions. Perhaps he prefers not to dwell on the fact that there can be no building without excavating, without, that is, both digging foundations on site and drawing or quarrying from the earth the materials from which the building is made and to which ultimately they will return. For there to be building, excavation is as necessary as construction. And whenever material is taken out by excavation, pressures from the surrounding earth, which may behave very like a fluid and have a high liquid content, these pressures can cause the walls of the new formed crater to cave in. To prevent this from happening, foundation walls have often to be propped up with temporary reinforcements. But architects' plans and elevations show nothing of what is going on underground. The bulb of the earth that absorbs the pressure of the building bearing down upon it remains invisible to them, as do the seismic shifts that occur when pressure bulbs collide. Beneath the ground, the foundations of buildings converse with soil and tree roots, with burrowing animals and subterranean waters. And it's there down below, and not at the ground surface, that the city has to contend with the forces of disintegration. I know no better example of this than the story of the hillside church of Saint-Germain-de-Charon on the outskirts of Paris, as told by the anthropologist Germain Willemont. Originally built in the 12th century, the church had stood soundly for 800 years, although the 19th century addition of flying buttresses on the down-facing side indicated that some stability issues had been encountered in the past. But these were hugely exacerbated in the years following the Second World War, as intensive urbanization led to the demolition of the small workers' dwellings that had once neighbored the church and the construction of large apartment blocks higher up on the hillside. So by the early 2000s, cracks were beginning to appear in the church, which eventually became so dangerous that it had to be closed. And the engineers called in to investigate the problem discovered that the weight of new buildings was causing the layers of clayey soil to slide down the hill and beneath the church. And the solution they adopted was to drill holes beneath the floor of the church to the depth of solid bedrock and to fill the holes with concrete. In effect, the church is now standing on piles or on stilts, supported by the bedrock, whilst the soil continues to flow beneath. And in this regard, as Merlemont suggests, it resembles the pile dwellings traditional to many swampy or riverine environments, except that in this case, the fluid element is a slowly sliding layer of soil. But it's not only below ground that buildings have to contend with the forces of the elements. Above, they are lashed by wind and weather. Now, these are elements the modern architect would rather not have to deal with. Unwelcome guests in the studio of design. Confounding reason, refusing containment, eroding structure, and caring nothing for progress, weather, has long figured in the modern imagination as architecture's nemesis. Yet there's no avoiding it in practice. Weather, moreover, is also weathering. And weathering, as the architects Mohsen Mostafafi and David Leatherborough argue, weathering is a process of not only deterioration, but also renewal, a continuous metamorphosis, they call it. 
that lends the building an ever-changing finish. Here, amid the swirling atmosphere above and the shifting soil below, we can begin to see how the building, just like a ship at sea, serves as a nexus for the concentration and discharge of materials and for the gathering of its inhabitants, sunk in a semi-supporting medium and placed at the centre of a world of earth and sky. And by the same token, the ground becomes a surface not so much of support as of transition, subject to its own variations and instabilities. Like the ocean, it is everywhere, and our buildings float in it. Now, at a time of climatic warming, with rising seas and an increasing frequency of flooding events, whether from storms and cyclones or marine inundation, we can ask, with landscape architects Anurada Matur and Dilip Dakuna, whether the world we live in, and I quote, is better served by being thought of as an ocean of rain rather than a landscape of rivers, and what this might mean for spatial design. The riverine perspective favoured by most governments presents the landscape as a mosaic of dry, solid grounds suitable for settlement, dissected by channels for draining away surplus water. Flood, then, is perceived as a problem of inadequate drainage. The alternative, which Matur and Dakuna advocate, is to see the land itself as an ocean, a ubiquitous wealth of wetness that is everywhere before it is somewhere, that rises and falls with the rains, soaks before it flows, seeps before it runs, spreads before it gathers, blurs before it clarifies. This wetness, they insist, is not so much a problem as an invitation, an inducement to build differently with the ocean as our milieu. With the efforts of engineers to barricade the land from watery invasion already close to breaking point and sustainable only at prohibitive cost, not just to society but to the environment, this alternative, I think, is to be welcomed. But what might it mean to re-engineer the city in a post-terrestrial world? Now, in a recent discussion of this question, Philip Steinberg wonders what would happen were we to put aside the assumptions on which civil engineering has largely proceeded up to now, namely that society occurs on land and that protecting society means defending the land from the sea, and seek instead to incorporate the sea into the very foundations of the city, thus joining the city and the sea together. Or to return to my opening question, what if the city were an ocean and its buildings ships? My answer is that the idea of buildings floating in a fluid medium is not just a speculative vision for the city of the future, nor a radical innovation in the present. It is rather a realistic depiction of urban infrastructure as it has existed from times past until today. So rather than conniving in the archipelagic illusion that the city is erected upon islands of solidity set against the surrounding seas, this is to substitute an image of what the island scholar Philip Haywood calls the aquapelago, an integrated land and aquatic space which opens equally to the air above, to the weather that occurs in it, to the wind-blown seeds borne by it, and to the birds that are as much in their element in the air as they are in the sea or on land. So whereas the archipelago divides the land from the sea and both from the sky, in the aquapelago, 
land, sea and sky are all rolled up together. And the virtue of this aquapelagic perspective for the architectural theorist Lindsay Bremner, Lindsay Bremner is that it acknowledges the essential fluidity of the earth in which we found our buildings and of the atmosphere with which they are destined to contend. I argue that by adopting such, uh, adopting such a perspective allows us to draw on architectural experience from both the past and the present in designing sustainable cities of the future. Remember that at sea, the attention of the mariner is directed not primarily to the surface of the ocean, but to what is going on below in the watery depths and above in the sky. Starting from David Lem's nautical charts, I suggested that the ground of the city may not, after all, be so different from the surface of the ocean, and that buildings like ships are not so much raised upon the ground as sunk into it. As the ground heaves with the swell of the elements, so buildings void up by the earth set sail under the heavens, corresponding not with the striations of the urban grid at ground level, but with the soil and air in the smooth space of the earth-sky world. Imagine a map of the city that would document such a world or help us navigate in it. On, the out, on, on this map, the outlines of buildings as seen from above would appear as mere shadows. The ground surface itself would not be represented, since, like the surface of the ocean, it is unmappable. Indeed, it's not really a surface at all, but a zone of transition and transformation where Earth meets sky in the ongoing generation of life. But the map would record the depths of foundations corresponding to points on the seabed. A compass rose would enable us to plot the variable directions of the wind, which we feel on our cheeks and in the folds of our clothing. And a range of icons would be placed on the map at points corresponding, corresponding to the locations of marker balls. We would have arrived back to where we began and where I'll end with this work, Debris and Phenomena. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are some questions by the public and also for, for the people who are online, you can uh, write up your hand and uh, but I have to stay there to Thank you very much. I'm trying to. Okay, just um, a very quick one. Uh, you seem to attach a political uh, uh, interpretation of this alfabeto. Uh, so I'm interested in see how this. Uh, on the one hand, we seem to define this idea as a level of a sustainable seat of the future, but I'm sure that would require us to move beyond the kind of policy that you were describing as a terrestrial policy. So, and the key point here is the idea of ship, right? And as you were drawing from solidarity and from the, you know, where it is attached to this notion of freedom. So, what is the political dimension? that we can draw from these half of the That's a great question, and I, I, I don't really know the answer. I mean, it, it's clear that 
that the polis of the kind that, that, that was devised by the ancient Greeks and which we've inherited as a kind of city-state that's on its on its island protected from the sea that that wouldn't work in a in a in a post-terrestrial world uh, and um, I don't know it, it, it may be that one could find models of alternative political arrangements from from other kinds of societies which are used to a more more nomadic uh, kind of life um, I, I think that um, it, it, it implies a trend towards political decentralization and that seems to me to be rather inevitable anyway and would actually not be a bad thing for for us generally so that so that the the kind of political order that I imagine in the in such a world would be would have the same characteristics as that what well, it would be extremely it, it would aim for fluidity it would be flux like uh, rather than solid in its in its operations but that's to speak on a very abstract level how, how it would work out concretely is impossible really I, I, I don't know except to say that it wouldn't be like the political as we tend to imagine it now I think that's the best answer I can. Questions? It takes real courage to jump with the cover up and the power, the powerful subvention of the Western view of what you propose has reminded me of the Paint of the Art Sea by Ultra Levin. That is a, a fantasy tale where the image of the archipelagos and the, uh, comes back in a different mm. vision and sets a different political order where humility and the contiguity between uh, earth and sea. Uh, together. And uh, so thank you. It, it's just a connection that <laughs> I made on uh, this stage. And thank you. Well, that's great. The, the, I, the, we should all go and read Ursula Le Guin and find, find the answer there. That would, be, would probably be an excellent place to go. I have a comment related to the Andrea's question. Of course, the, the term uh, foundation is very important in architecture, in philosophy, in politics. No? Uh, Western thought is founded on foundation. And you propose a, a new way of thinking, also of perception. So very bodily way to think, but I, uh, this kind of praxis, fluidity, fluidity is already a metaphoric that economy uses, in particular financial economy, you know, the capital fluxes, uh, fluxes uh, and these uh, no, no boundaries, uh, this way of uh, overwhelmed soil and boundaries and states and so on. Mm. So, what do you think about this uh, proximity in, in this met yeah. metaphor? I, I think there's actually a, a difference. The, the, the word that is most common in economics, the subject I know nothing about, but is, is, is liquidity. And, and so, they would talk about a currency, a liquid currency. And I, it, and I, I think there's a difference between liquidity and fluidity, uh, uh, which is a bit difficult to, to explain. But, um, but um, water, uh, we could say water is a liquid. Ice is a, let's say ice is a solid, water is a liquid. But that liquid water doesn't necessarily flow. But for fluidity, something has to flow. 
And uh, so, for example, uh, you know, you 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 can um, you can catch the air in a bottle, but you can't catch the wind because as soon as you bottled up the air, the wind's not there anymore. And and so I think there's a, because I have the feeling that the sort of thing that economists are talking about, where everything is convertible into everything else, is 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 something liquid rather than something fluid. And moreover, fluidity doesn't have to move at all fast. And there's, there's a famous experiment at the the pitch drop experiment in Australia where where they poured some some pitch into a tube with a little hole at the bottom. And eventually you know the pitch goes through the hole forms a drop. And so far, I think in the last, I think the experiment started around about 1929, and so far there have been three drops. Uh, so it's fluid, but it's very slow. And 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 there are lots of things in the world. You could even say you look at a you look at at, at um, uh, igneous rock that once flowed out of a volcano, and you can see the flow patterns there, but that rock is not going anywhere fast. But it's still has this quality of, of, of flux. So, at least I think there, there is a distinction to be, to be made there, and, and, and that might, might help. want to say something more general, just a comment, uh, because this, uh, this talk is within a, a, a postgrad, a program of a postgrad course in the American humanities um, that uh, proposes a, a transdisciplinary approach, the idea of um, exchanging the, uh, some perspective, some differences uh, in various perspectives. And uh, it seems to me that uh, this talk resonates a lot with uh, this approach, this perspective, um, um, because um, it puts together a lot of uh, theories of knowledge, uh, nautics, uh, philosophy, architecture. And uh, I, I just want to recall um, and a figure that you um, about uh, uh, which you you write in correspondences uh, that one of uh, under uh, like as someone uh, that uh, is not a professional but uh, uh, someone who has a practice of cure of tension um, and maybe uh, because we uh, within the the, the, the post graduate course uh, uh, discussed a lot about the opportunities, but also the problems of a uh, uh, undisciplined or transdisciplinary perspective. And maybe this figure of amateur um, that is someone who has not a full possession of a topic, but uh, uh, a design of uh, practice in some way, uh, could be useful for the students. So if you, uh, it, it resonates to me uh, during this talk and actually yesterday. So if you want to, to say something about that, I, I, the, the matter that yes, I think all, all good scholars are amateurs. An amateur, an amateur uh, is someone who does something for the love of it. That's what, that's what it means, literally. So you're in love with your subject, and 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 so you pursue that just out of out of this love, um, not as part of a way to stage a career to get papers published to get up and climb the ladder, but just because you're completely fascinated by this topic. It doesn't matter what it is, what it is. So so there are plenty of amateur philosophers, for example, and and because philosophy means love a love of learning. And so uh, in way. Uh, a philosophy and amateurism go together, and um, I think that's the right way to study. And I think that the professionalization of academic disciplines 
is responsible for a lot of the problem of communication and education that we're having at the moment. Um, there's a quite separate issue about, you know, that, that, that in sport, for example, uh, amateur means that you're not being paid, uh, and whereas a professional sportsman is being paid. So then it gets a completely different set of issues about how exactly this amateur scholar is going to get a slice of bread to eat every day. And, and so we all know those issues of, of, of um, insecurity and precarity that are affecting so many people in, in scholarship. But I, I still think that um, a degree of deprofessionalization would be helpful in, in the academic world. Uh, and it also makes it all much more fun. <laughs> and I, being an amateur on the whole is like I play the cello and I really enjoy being an amateur cellist. But if I become a professional cellist, I'm quite sure my life will be absolutely miserable, as it is for most second-rate orchestral musicians. So, so there's a lot to be said for, for, for amateur, amateur scholarship, and it doesn't mean that the amateur is in any sense inferior in, the, the, in, in knowledge or wisdom or anything else. But yeah, I, I, yeah, we should all become amateurs and be proud of it. <laughs> Enrico? Dario, vuoi ricordare al pubblico la casa forte? Ok, quindi so, uh, I'm very grateful to you for your interesting and inspiring uh, lesson. But since my English comprehension skills are a bit fluctuating and not so solid, and what ground did I translate uh, and I had to read it. Uh, so I followed the lesson by reading uh, the text uh, that the organizer shared to us, that you published on the Evergreen in volume 3. So I don't know if uh, uh, maybe I missed some important contents, and I apologize for that. In any case, uh, mm, it seems to me that from a philosophical point of view, um, you are suggesting abandoning an ontology uh, the traditional one of objects to faces, grounds, that we find in Rhodes and James Gibson that you mentioned, uh, to embrace another one, which is more materialistic or more elemental in the sense of natural elements, so water, wine, other flows, weather in general, at a certain moment you talk about the weather, it struck me uh, a lot that you say that this mythology is inimical to life, at least in the text. Oops. An enemy of, of the life. And I think the same, um, but at the same time I ask myself uh, uh, this problem. How to deal with seasickness, to, to stay within the margin of your metaphor? Because uh, with seasickness, we suffer from the instability of our ground. And this can happen, metaphorically speaking, in many cases in social life. Uh, for example, when we human animals are in the grip of our emotion, like in anxiety or in a panic attack, it is a good therapeutic practice to assume what is called a grounding position with our body which means focusing one attention on how the body is connected to the ground. And after all, emotions are waves and flows. And when we don't know how to process them verbally, it's always good to simply let them pass, anchoring ourselves to the ground. So maybe we need a theory that includes both flows and ground in a while. And what do you think about it? Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, a wonderful question. I, it's just that I, I, one, one of my most brilliant PhD students long ago, now, now a researcher, did field work with, um, with uh, fishermen off Shetland and was out at sea in many pretty rough situations. And um, there was a whole section of his thesis devoted to, to seasickness and and whether anybody, even these skilled fishermen who have been out on boats, whether they ever actually could conquer 
seasick bits because the thing about it is you can't if you get used to one kind of rhythm then as soon as it's another one you're, you're back at sea again you actually found that I should perhaps mention it that, 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 that if you're a man the, the cure for seasickness is to watch pornographic films this apparently uh, solves the problem immediately but uh, it's no good as you <laughs> it only works only works for that but otherwise the more seriously, I, I, I think that the, I believe that the cure, the, the best cure is, is to keep your eyes absolutely fixed on the horizon. That, if, if, if this, this, the boat is rocking endlessly, if you keep your eyes actually on the horizon, you're okay. Uh, and, and which means that you, you, you take that as your reference, not the deck of the surface that you're actually standing on. Uh, and then, then, then it's okay. But, but as you say, there's a, there's a, there's a more, more fundamental point about um, uh, nausea. Since we, we get the word noise from nausea, it comes from seasickness. This sort of sense of, of disorientation, which is, which is not unlike that when people report um, experiences of earthquakes, for example, or, or situations where suddenly the ground doesn't behave as you expect it to behave, and, it, it, and it's it's profoundly disorienting. So then you wonder whether I'm, I'm wondering here, but but um, the, the part part of a part of the argument that I, I didn't include here was a was a critique of um, the ecological psychology of James Gibson, which has otherwise been hugely influential for me. Where, where Gibson speaks of the ground as the most fundamental surface of all, the reference surface for all other surfaces. So he imagines the world as everything being basically on the ground, and then, and then hills and trees and houses, they're all on the ground, and other things are on the trees, hills and trees, but there's always this ground underneath. And, and I was trying to argue with my students that if we start trying to find this most fundamental ground, we'll, 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 never, we'll never find it. I took, them, I took my students to the beach in Aberdeen, which is a shingle, when at high tide it's a shingle beach, and I said, right, well, where's the ground? Are all these pebbles on the ground? So let's lift up all the pebbles, and if we lift up all the pebbles, then we'll surely find the ground. So we lift up all the pebbles and we find more pebbles, and more pebbles, and and, and then you, be, after a while, begin to realise that there is no such thing as the ground, and what we're, what we're calling the ground is actually a sort of place where earth and sky intermingle, and where all life is lived, so that we're actually living in the ground rather than on it. And the ground is this is this place where 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 earth and sky come together, and and it's only because they come together that things. Can live. I mean, you can only pl plants can only live because of the of photosynthesis, which which requires uh, a mixing of, of of moist of water and carbon dioxide in the presence of sunlight. So you, you have to bring the earth, the the wet earth, and the air and the sun together, bind those together for any growth, any organic growth to happen at all. And if we if we concreted over or asphalted over everything, then no life uh, would, would be possible. So, so those are the sorts of things I was, I was thinking about, and, and, and so I'm trying to think what, what would happen if we, if, we, um, if we set aside this idea that at least underneath everything else there's the ground. What if we set that aside and thought of the ground as this zone where in which life is lived if we start with the earth and the air or the earth and the sky rather than starting with the ground so that the ground doesn't separate the earth and the sky but actually brings them together how that relates to to seasickness and the and how you cure it by looking at the horizon, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but the, but the horizon itself is, is, is the most perplexing of lines. Uh, it really is, and, and, and you think, what, what, what actually is 
is the horizon. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to figure out um, what it is. Uh, and and we, one reason why, why, why um, landscape painters, for example, never manage to get it quite right. Because if you're, if you're painting a landscape, you have to paint the earth with some colours, and then you paint the sky with some other colours, so it's where the sort of sky colours meet the like grey and blues, meet the greens and browns, and there's a transition point, and you say that's the horizon. But if you look out in, in, in the countryside and you say there's a horizon, it's not like that at all, because um, the ground is a reflexive, reflecting surface. The air has no surface at all. Uh, you're just looking into it. And, and the clouds are not objects hanging in the sky. And the sky isn't actually a great big dome. So, so, so we, we really get into a problem. You know, how, what, what on earth is a cloud? And, and how, it's not an object floating around in the sky. It seems to be a fold, a, a sort of crumple of the sky itself. And then you think, well, the next case and what about the earth it's all it's all crumpled up so I began to think of the of the world not as this void which is filled as a void with ground surface and then things on it but imagine imagine it's something more like an enormous sponge and then it's squeezed and stretched in different places and the things that we find in the world are like squeezes and scratches and lumps and Thing in, in, in this sponge it means we start with the idea of the world as one continuous material flowing flexible material stuff and things that we perceive are like like bends and folds and crumples of, of this stuff so anyway I'm going to, that's what I've been thinking about <coughs> Uh, the questions also from home. Give us a sign in this case. And no. No sign. Okay. Francesco, you have to. No, okay. I will come up, of course. Please. Listening to your uh, evocation of liquid or fluid elements, it came to my mind uh, the story, the story of the liquid that's not only a liquid, it's a great story that you know for sure. It was written by a Polish novelist, Stanislav Len, it's called Solaris. And uh, the, the main character of the story is that. Uh, well, an object, a, a liquid object, a, a, a thinking ocean. And this thinking ocean is able to, well, it is liquid, technically, but uh, it is able to produce islands. Um, so it's uh, at the same time liquid and solid. Uh, and in this case, if I remember well, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the ontological view the ontogenic yeah. in an article against this collab, uh, if I remember well. And I was absolutely uh, on, on the line. And in this case, could we focus rather than uh, the product uh, of the production uh, on the ontogenic level or, or the ontogony, if you uh, think this process in, in terms of generation? Oh, I think so, yes. I, 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 I would like to, um, I, I don't like the ontological term, but I, I think we should have an ontogenetic one, and, indeed, and, and that we should think of, um, of, of forms that's arising within uh, processes of development. Um, and actually works, one can, you were talking about this, this book, Solaris, but it, it actually works quite well too with many many indigenous cosmologies, uh, myths about how the world was formed, in, in so many, among so many peoples, you find the same story that um, 
uh, like in many many North American uh, Amerindian First Nations myths, uh, the raven or, or some, some some water creature, rat, uh, water rat or something, dives deep down and eventually comes up with a little bit of mud, mud in its mouth. And then it dives down and, and, and gets a bit more and, and gradually it forms a little kind of raft in what was a completely watery world. And the raft grows and grows and grows. And that's the earth that we're on, completely surrounded by water below and air above. So, so, so in those myths, there's, there's already the idea that there's something very contingent about the earth, that it's just like this kind of a, a, a bit like those islands of waste of debris that are forming in the Pacific Ocean. It's just a kind of mat that are somehow of, of stuff that's got, got tangled up together, uh, which is floating somehow uh, and not very secure. And, uh, and somehow, somehow we've got, in our myth of modernity, we've got this opposite view of this absolutely solid platform. Uh, and I, I, I'm not quite sure, you know, does this go, is, is this due to the Greeks or what it was, how, how we got this. But, but anyway, we've got, we've got a quite different kind of, of idea of, of how the world was formed. And, and maybe one should go back to, to those, that kind of mythological cosmogenic way of thinking about how could a world, the world we actually inhabit, not the world described by physicists, but the world we actually inhabit, how could it be, how could it be formed out of materials that are inherently, inherently sloshy, sludgy, sludgy, sort of not, not, not solid or fluid, but, but something something in between, uh, the, but, but, but very sort of fertile and generative of life. Isn't the, the ancient Egyptians um, venerate the hippopotamus, and there are lots of hippopotamus images in ancient Egyptian tombs, uh, because they're supposed to give everlasting life to the person who's, who's buried there. And the whole thing about the hippopotamus was that it, it's a creature that, that um, inhabits this, this most fertile medium of, of mud and can move freely between being submerged in the water and being out of it. It's, it's, and and, and that, that, that's a huge source of generative power. And, and, and perhaps we should, I'm, I'm just thinking that it might be a good idea to start from, from that idea of primordial sludge which, after all, biology, when people talk about the origins of life nowadays, that's exactly the sort of medium, media that they, 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 they have in mind. So when, when they send, when these ridiculous people send, send rockets off to Mars, and hoping we'll find life there, they have no idea what, what life is, so I don't know how they're going to find it, but, 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 but maybe they should actually be looking to sludge. <laughs> There are no more questions, we will be going to close. So we will change uh, our logo of the master from Shingyade, I don't know, to the hippopotam, maybe, <laughs> or another amphibian. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. So thank you very much, Tim, to be with us, and uh, thank you to everybody.